All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today um, in our fourth installment of Healthy Hearty Heifers. This week, we're going to be focusing on hoof health, and we have an amazing speaker for you today, Dr. Dorte Dopfer from the University of Wisconsin. Um, so today, Casey's going to run our few slides while we get started. Go ahead, Casey. So just to remind you, this is our fourth week. Um, we have heard from a few different people early on and we're almost halfway through our series. So uh, join us the same time each of the following Fridays through November 19th uh, to hear some more uh, amazing speakers. Um, and just again, we wanna thank our sponsors. Uh, we have four amazing sponsors to keep this program at no cost to our participants. So thank you to Diamond V, Arm & Hammer Nutrition, Zenpro, and Pool and & Grain. So today I am happy to present to you Dr. Dorothy Dopfer. Um, she is uh, a veterinarian epidemiologist and microbiologist by training. And she's an associate professor in the food animal production medicine section of the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. She works on large data sets um, that involves infectious disease dynamics, spatial modeling, food safety, and the emergence of antimicrobial resistance factors. In addition, and what we are most excited for, uh, lameness, particularly digital dermatitis, prediction models for rare events, and machine learning for One Health, uh, as well as farm animal production medicine, computer vision models, and disease surveillance, surveillance are part of her research projects. So welcome, Dr. Dortford. Thank you so much for presenting to us today and take it away. Okay, well, hello to everyone. Good day, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to um, our colleague from Europe and North America. My name is Dörte Döpfler and I'm German of origin, um, have lived in Madison, Wisconsin for the past 13 years. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And actually, I must not have updated my CV, but I'm a professor by now. And um, what does that mean? I talk the same way. I do the very similar work and I want to create more awareness about prevention and control of digital dermatitis in young stock, because um, if one message comes through today, it is that we, the herd managers and um, claw health um, responsible people, we are part of the problem, or we can be part of the problem when it comes to efficient prevention and control of DD in young stock. And I want to emphasize that there's a dilemma of chronically affected dairy heifers and beef heifers, the same that acquire digital dermatitis before they ever calf for the first time. And then um, by carrying chronically affected heifers into our lactating herds, that makes the problem even worse, particularly if there's an ongoing prevention and control system in the lactating herd that is um, challenged by chronically affected heifers. How does this go about? I want to um, show you one more slide here from my Prezi, and that is to set a starting um, point of information. Digital skin is the borderline between the host, being cattle, and the outside world. And um, it's going to function as that and dysfunction as that barrier, whether it is intact and normal and healthy or not. So, to emphasize this is whatever we would bring this skin being affected by DD or not in contact with, it's gonna absorb, resorb and interplay, interact with the environment, whether it's diseased or not. And if we look at, for example, here, um, these different cases of digital dermatitis and they are well known for these actively and acutely painful ulcerated um, surfaces. If you look at the left-hand side, this is a first time around case in a heifer. Um, I think shortly after calving, this image comes from Italy. And you see these ulcers here, they're called kissing lesions for being so um, symmetric at the skin horn border here in the um, plantar aspect of the, this foot. And um, the prospects for topical treatment um, 
for these different lesions here, these four different lesions are very different. So in other words, digital dermatitis lesions are not created equal and we have to develop an eye and conscientiousness um, and, and a conscience as well for how far has the chronicity and repetitiveness of these lesions gone in order to be more successful at treating them and preventing flare-ups, recurrence of these lesions. So this lesion in the heifer still has quite good prospects for being treated topically and um, not recurring many times um, throughout the life, and particularly the productive life of this, this animal. Well, here in a lactating cow, this is um, more than a first lactation animal, two plus lactations for sure. You can see the first signs of chronicity in the form of this hyperkeratosis, this dyskeratosis of the skin around the ulcerated surface. In addition, in my third picture here shows you a pedestal of extra formed epidermis and, and, um, and proliferation actually. So on top of this pedestal, you have a, a, an ulcer that is typical of what I call M2 lesions, M standing for mortillaro. Motilaro's disease is another um, name for digital dermatitis. And if you go to the extremes of hairy heel warts where the ulcer is on top of like a, a half of a chicken's egg sized hairy proliferative lesion, then these one, two, three lesions have very, very poor prospects for successful um, treatment. So whatever we apply topically to these lesions, they will probably never heal completely to form normal skin like this pinkish skin here again. In other words, digital dermatitis is for life. And what does that mean? It puts a certain em emphasis, a very strong emphasis on preventing digital de dermatitis in heifers pre-calving. How does this go about? Well, briefly, the decontrol in pre-calving heifers is your best chance at prevention and control of DD in the lactating cows because they're gonna be mixed eventually. And um, actually, given the chronic sequelae of digital dermatitis, it's not just about the red painful ulcers, it is about those proliferations, it's about heel horn erosion, sole ulcers that form in the long run by disturbed, repeatedly disturbed horn formation. And therefore we can control many, if not most of all other claw diseases, if we have good control on digital dermatitis. What we really don't want to see are these um, heifers. Oops, excuse me, I wanted to activate my video. We want, don't want to see these very, very lame heifers that don't know how to crawl, basically. You see here the right front foot is, um, uh, the toe tip is abraded. This is a club formed blocky claw. You see this animal um, um, has lost muscle mass. So they don't do well. And actually a heifer that has acquired this lesion pre-calving will, um, suffer from claw conformation changes um, for all of her life. So these blocky claws, emaciation, emaciation, weight loss, there will be fertility problems, reproduction problems, because these heifers stay on average 25 days um, open longer until they conceive. They have milk production losses between 300 to 400 kilograms of milk during their first lactation due to repeated lesions of digital dermatitis. And um, I cannot just make this bigger than we can see the full frame. So chronic consequences of TD are not limited to the feet. They're, they are expanded to much more. And I think we haven't even begun to truly estimate the economic losses associated with digital dermatitis, particularly when it comes to heifers pre-calving and for their entire productive life. Very often these heifers pre-calving are in suboptimal housing situations. They very often in smaller farms, particularly they are um, housed in pens neighboring the sick and the dry cows that have probably been affected by digital dermatitis before to some degree. And there's, there's this is um, transmission between these pens. Or what you can see sometimes is if there's a, a, a bull in these pens as well, 
um, I've seen this in Europe many times, that the bull is chronically affected by DV and probably transmitting DV to these um, pristinely healthy um, heifers. So old facilities, less care, larger hygiene problems, crowding of these um, facilities, ventilation problems, even if the, the roof looks um, a little bit more modern ventilation problems contribute to hygiene problems. And um, um, very often there are no or hardly any um, detection efforts when it comes to claw diseases, um, particularly if hygiene is very bad. Yeah, so one fact leads to the other and exacerbates the situation. And um, from here, if you want to think about DD, well, there's often the question, when does this start? When, does, when is DD introduced into the, the, these groups of pre-calving heifers first to result in this type of lesions, these chronic crater-like tissue losses here in the back of, this, of, the, of the feet, proliferations, um, blocky claws, high severity lameness cases, this is a big problem. And um, if we look into a heifer barn, for example, and I mentioned the dry cows and sick cows being the neighbors to my um, initially youngest heifers that have no visible DD lesions and are healthy. If you go from, in this virtual case, pen one, two, to my pen three with the older um, heifers, they have um, no visible DD lesion, but there's a hygiene problem because the amount of manure and organic matter that is present in these pens as the heifers grow, um, so age goes here from right to left, um, these hygiene problems only get worse. And then there's a moment when you can identify one pen of heifers with a maximum prevalence of DD. They're acutely lame, they have big ulcerative lesions, and to the left of that, the oldest heifers that are about to calve, where we have chronic DD, there's the occasional ac active flare-up of an M2 lesion. It is important for us to identify this pen with maximum prevalence. And if we think about a prevention and control strategy to please calculate about 60 to 90 days back, and that would be about here, where your um, prevention and control system with foot baths, regular foot baths, detection efforts, topical treatment efforts, and that includes the necessity for facilities that make topical treatments um, possible. So all of this should happen already 60 to 90 um, days back. And usually these um, maximum prevalence um, pens are the ones for heifers that have returned from a, a heifer a rearing faci facility where there was a mixing um, um, of heifers of different origin present where there was poor hygiene, high density of animals and so forth. So whatever is your maximum prevalence age, calculate those 60 to 90 days back, this is where your prevention system should start. And I'm going to take you into a heifer barn with about a thousand heifers from three months until 24 months um, of age. These are prepartum heifers. They were housed in eight times two rows for um, older and then eight times two rows for the younger heifers. So it was quite a facility. You can tell that um, by here on the left hand side margin that there was a hygiene problem. And um, that was just due to the sheer amount of animals housed in the same facility. So what does this look like? So um, we have these rows. And if you go from um, three months, the youngest heifers to the 12 months, so breeding age um, heifers, there was increasing age, but there was basically no lesion visible until you go into 13 to 15 months. So there were a few chronic lesions, these little dyskeratotic lesions, but no active open ulcerative lesions. And then once you increase the age towards the 60 months old, 
There were few active lesions, open ulcers, and those that were visible were serious ones. So these um, heifers were um, very lame. And um, then followed by a 20 month old um, pen of lower prevalence DD lesions, the M2 lesions, the open active lesions. And then at 23 months, when um, heifers recently returned from heifer grower facility where there was mixing of heifers of different origin going on. This is what this is what my um, pen of maximum prevalence was um, identified as. And then if I calculate 60 to 100 days back, so I think at least here um, there should be prevalent, so preventive measures being started. And act, actually, there were three foot baths here on the outside of these pens, and I was reassured that these heifers were being run through formalin foot baths on a regular basis. But the formalin used actually was concentrated at 10%, which is way too high. In other words, foot baths that are used too frequently or too high in concentration for with whichever um, chemical agent is used for these foot baths including if we have an extremely acid pH, uh, around one, one and a half, sometimes you hear this for copper sulfate foot baths. If you have these extremes, actually you will exacerbate the, um, the outbreaks of DD because you're irritating those wound surfaces even more. After the 23 months of age up to um, calving, you have these oldest heifers that have, um, a few active lesions in terms of ulcers, but most of these lesions are chronic. See so a lot of emaciated heifers. You see um, blocky hooves, blocky claws, and um, proliferative lesions. So those are reservoirs of infection that are gonna be carried into the lactating herd once these heifers calve. Mm -hmm. so, um, I want to show you what these feed look like. Remember the young heifers from three to 12 months old, no DD, these are what I call happy feet. Then if you go into the older ones from um, 13 to 16 months old, you have some in zeros, these are the healthy ones. You have some M2, so active lesions, but with proliferation, you see some blocky claws where the toe tips are abraded. You see the comparison between a normal claw and a blocky claw. And you have lots of these chronic lesions with proliferations or open active lesions that are surrounded by this pedestal of extra tissue. Um, and then if you go into the, um, yeah, the, the worst pen, you see these large diameters of lesions. These animals are, are particularly lame. Here you see the extent of the proliferation in the back of the feet. These heifers will probably never recover from DD completely in, DD is for life in this um, context. So the dilemma is that pre-calving barn heifers and pre-fresh heifers can be clean or they can be hard, uh, very much affected like we saw on the example before, but there are some farms, some dairy farms that have, that have actually very clean, very healthy heifers. And if they cross over into a lactating herd that is um, chronically affected, particularly if that is exacerbated by bad leg hygiene in the lactating herd, you will see feet that I call, you know, they have the aspect of like chicken nuggets, if you want, they are all encrusted with manure. Um, so if I cross over these clean pre-calving heifers, you see one example into um, a lactating herd that has a massive DD problem, particularly if there are, um, hygiene problems that can um, lead to outbreaks in the heifers, exacerbated then by an, another wave of, of, of lesions in the lactating of the older cows. Or on the other hand side, if I have pre-calving heifers and pre-fresh heifers that are chronically affected, like we saw in the example before, then, and they come into a um, lactating herd of older cows where there's good control, that can be a challenge as well. So we have to be um, aware that infectious pressure by heifers gives away the effort of, control, of controlling DD in the lactating herd and vice versa. This is what I call the DD dilemma.
So one more time, the message, you have to identify your heifer age group with maximum DD prevalence, count 60 to 90 days back and start your prevention program that includes topical treatments, foot baths. Remember, don't overdose the concentration of your chemicals. Don't use extremely acid pHs, it's not necessary. You, there's a rule for good hoof trimming in these pre-calving heifers. So, because think about the horn formation disturbances due to repeated DD. Um, some of these claw conformation problems, some of these problems are reversible. So good hoof trimmers um, of, for heifers even, and consideration of hoof trimming for heifers pre-calving is um, worth your time. And then, I talked about detection of DD in heifers. What are our options? Well, first we have to think about the different stages of DD from M0s to have healthy ones into M1s, these little indents here, these imperfections that are smaller than two centimeters. Imagine taking a green split pea and pressing it into your own skin. This is about the extent of these M1 lesions, the early lesions. At this stage, the treponemes, which are microbes that are strictly anaerobic, these terpenes have not descended deep down into the dermis, uh, epidermis and dermis just yet. And these M1 lesions, they can be grayish or, or red like this one, pinkish red. At this stage, the terpenes have not descended down. They come and go, these lesions, in intervals of about eight days. And under the impact of bad hygiene, high animal, animal density, suddenly there's an explosive tissue um, loss and affection and you get these raw ulcerative lesions we call them m2 they're larger than two centimeters larger than quarter size 25 cents of the us coins and um, they can be very painful from here if we treat these um, lesions topically then we get an in a scab formation we call these healing lesions m3 they are only present for a very short period of time, between um, um, seven to 12 days, this scab is lost. What remains are the chronic lesions, we call them m 4 and the chronic lesions can be hyperkeratotic, like here, this inverted um, little V. Um, and if you imagine rolling this part of the skin between your fingers, it actually is um, right, very callous. And you have to imagine that the treponemes that are causally associated with DD are residing in these skin, uh, skin parts and um, they change morphology to, to go into kind of a hibernation state, into a dormant state. But under the right or the wrong um, hygiene and risk factor circumstances, they can flare up and um, cause new lesions. So we have hyperkeratotic stages for M4 and we have these proliferative st uh, stages these hairy heel warts, um, the M4 piece, these are the ones that have given the name to digital dermatitis. And within the perimeters of these M4 stages, actually small M1s can flare up under bad hygiene circumstances. We call them M4 for being chronic, 0.1 for having these little lesions within the perimeter. And these actually will cross over into new M2 lesions, closing the cycle of digital dermatitis. So we need to break the cycle at this stage, keeping everything that's chronic where it's chronic and probably for life, and um, break the cycle right here where we prevent M1 stages, the early ones, going into M2. So this is the cycle idea of different um, M stages for DD. Then detection is important in the sense um, if we are able to get our heifers into a situation like a single file. We can do, do the pen walks. And I will try to get the sound away, but I do want it to play. This is a big one. So this is me diving for a, a, um, an inspection of the back of the feet. And there's a colleague here up front actually making records. Somehow this is not playing very well. So I'm, I'm just gonna jump to the different settings. This is me doing the same thing behind cattle, trying to find a lesion. This is me doing this in a milking carousel. What I'm punching into my iPad there are um, records using the DD Check app that is freely available on the internet. This is a way to score large numbers of cattle. 
You can get them into a single cow line right here. I'm going to 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 use um, low stock um, stockmanship to inspect them. I'm apologizing for how this video is not playing well. But um, you can get cattle without major rodeos into um, a single line and get quite a, an acceptable view of their hind feet. Um, then you can do alley checks for beef cattle, where we were grouping about three of them. But, I mean, we are crowding an entire pen into the back of this corridor. We would have um, three of the steers coming to the, the gate where they want to go home. I have about 10 seconds to score these three steers. My helper is here at the gate and reporting. So there are ways for doing this with beef cattle. And this is me on a horse scoring about um, 200 of these um, little steers while they're feeding at the feed bunk. And today what we're doing is we are attaching cameras to the stirrups of pen riders in order to obtain images. These images are fed into computer vision, so artificial intelligence models, and then um, we score them automatically using artificial intelligence. And this is to help people recognize these lesions better. Another option, since there's not much visibility in a milking robot, robot is we designed these wooden pedestals and we attach GoPro cameras with a light source to obtain images in milking robots. Another way for obtaining images for these computer vision and artificial intelligence models. Documentation of DD um, using the DD Check app. If you go into the iOS um, app store, it's only available for Apple products, sorry. And um, you can download this DD Check app, where if you punch in the different um, stages of DD together with hypertrophic or proliferative, you can generate treatment lists. You can email these lists. You can generate, if you score the same cows repeatedly, um, graphs like this, where we one, two, three, or whichever time interval that you are choosing, you can um, obtain these bar charts and then the more faint one actually in all of these three and this is M0 and two and four those that were scored. The, the faint um, bars are actually projections into the future based on the transitions between these M stages that were made in the um, identified cows that were scored repeatedly. So there's a mathematical model attached to to this. It allows you to predict outbreaks of DD before they happen. Um, so as a decision aid as to when to intensify your customized foot, modernized foot bathing strategy and which cows to treat. Um, from here, leg hygiene in heifers is a problem. It's commonly neglected, but it makes a huge difference. So looking into these feeds, right? Um, the facility is very old, but the, the leg hygiene is good. Um, looking into the quality of the, 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 the flooring that um, cattle walk on, why is this important? Because if you have very defective um, flooring for these pre calving heifers, what happens is one claw of the two claws of the foot is going to be supported by, for example, the stone, but the other one kind of falls down which overstretches the interdigital skin, which is a risk factor for microtrauma, allowing microbes to enter into the skin. And remember how this is how, start, how digital dermatitis starts. You get these little epithelial um, lesions um, that are colonized by bacteria. And this could be the start for, um, for digital dermatitis outbreaks. So foot baths in heifers should have the right dimensions. We should not have these side steps for animals to be able to um, just step on the on the little step and avoid the foot bath. They should not be manure baths that are more able to transmit DD than not. They should have these more diagonal sides. They should be long enough. Cattle should slow down, step into it conscientiously, and leave. Um, the alleyways before and after should be scraped and clean so that um, the effect of the foot bath is not lost due to an immediate immersion into um, a lot of organic matter. Um, we talked about pH concentration and frequency. We talked about hoof trimming, hygiene, and the interdigital space at uh, risk of being overstretched once you have defe defects in the flooring. 
we talked about um, um, horn conformation defects if you have repeated TT lesions. So leg hygiene in conjunction with how the foot regenerates is one of the measures that you can apply for preventing and controlling DT. Then if you ask me how to customize a foot bath strategy, I would answer you, well, choose for a foot bath that is, for example, in an endemic situation for DD, um, this foot bath of the right dimensional de design should be implemented on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, once per day. And um, somebody should perform these detection pen walks or have some form of detection for DD. And then if you see an increase in these chronic lesions with the hairy or pedestal-like proliferations of the skin, this acquires you a, a, a bad tempered smiley. So if this goes up, check your hoof bath as to what concentration and frequency um, are. Lower concentration of, um, of the chemical or lower the frequency or both. And um, keep monitoring for these proliferative lesions. If the number of proliferative and four lesions goes down, you get the green light. These are the first signs of success if you see less proliferative lesions. I'm going to show you a picture as to what this looks like. If you see a number, the number of M2 lesions, the active ulcerative lesions that are larger than quarter size, larger than two centimeters in diameters, go up, you have to think about, is your hoof path um, designed correctly? Is it effective? Is it effective of preventing this, um, this transition from the M4.1s into M2? And um, you have to make an effort or consider making the effect, the, the effort to detect M2 lesions earlier. Improve your topical treatment protocol, revisit it, manage risk factors like the bad leg hygiene. If you see the number of M2 lesions, particularly the flare ups on top of proliferative lesions go down, green light, then you should keep on doing um, um, what you're doing with this strategy, manage your risk factors customize your foot bathing frequency and chemical concentration. Think about cow types. We type our cows with regards to affection by DD um, into a type one cow that never develops M2 lesions. Type two cows develop them once and then not again for a long period of time. Type three um, cows are the ones that have repeated lesions and they can come back every 14 days. Those are your problem cows, but we can use these type three cows as sentinels and signals in the sense of if they become worse in terms of frequency and, and um, extension of the lesions, then we need to check the entire herd for um, other lesions because the type three cows are just the tip of the iceberg. Comes the day when we have gone through more, many of these green light situations where we can afford to, for example, substitute one of these days um, for a biocide or a disinfectant like um, a 1% chlorine um, solution. We can substitute out, um, swap out the, the copper sulfate and undesirable formalin foot baths for something that is more sustainable and keep monitoring as long as the trends are here in the green lights. We're gonna continue with this foot bath uh, strategy. There are farms where we have to swap in copper sulfate and formaldehyde um, during certain seasons of higher risk. You monitor the trends in the cow types. You define what is called a manageable state of disease. And here is one of these other key messages that you should take home. Um, one of the first signs for a, su a successful prevention control system, particularly the one related to um, to foot bathing is that the chronic proliferative lesions, the M4s with proliferation, they actually shed part of the proliferation here in the form of these flaps. So if you see flaps falling, that means that your, um, your M4 lesions with hypercarotosis and the proliferations is being shaved off, off to a degree. And that is good because it reduces the reservoir of infection for others, and it reduces the potential for these lesions to flare up into active lesions, the M2 lesions, um, under the impact of risk factors. So please take this image to heart. If you see the flaps falling, you are making progress. I'm going to skip this one. So um, coming to a conclusion here, um, there's a reaffirmation and then proof again 
I think they used um, 5,000 animals that were genotyped type to show that there's a genetic predisposition for chronic DD, and this will allow pre-screening of cattle for DD. The manuscript is now being um, submitted, and um, I think that um, pre-screening for DD, when we would be um, able to have these cattle separated into predisposed and more resilient, this will focus our preventive resources and the effort that it needs to um, prevent DD. And this is affecting heifers as well, right? If we had a, 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 a knowledge and information in terms of this pre-screening test for predisposed versus resilient heifers, this will contribute um, considerably for preventing outbreaks um, throughout their lives. So with this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We are at about 35 um, minutes of, of this interaction. Thank you so much for, inter uh, for your attention and I'm open to, um, to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Dopfer. That's excellent, very, very good information. So we'll give people a few minutes to um, put some questions in the question in the Q and A box. Um, and um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for some questions, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> um, what do you? So there's a lot of organic farms in northern New York and in central south central New York and the regions that Betsy Lindsay and I cover. What do you recommend for heifers that spend most of their time on pasture? Is there an effective way to get a foot bath in there? So, um, good question. The, the cattle on pasture and pasture being considered um, preventive for digital dermatitis, that's certainly true. As long as there are no regions or no locations where everybody crosses paths, particularly in the mud, so you have to think between gates, at watering troughs, at feed barns, where hay is dispensed. So um, looking into the, the soil conformation in locations where all the heifers will, and, and cattle will cross paths is worth your time because you have to imagine a, an animal with one of these active lesions, each step will leave an imprint of infectious material on the ground. And um, that is a risk for cross-contamination of others. Plus, if you want to recall what I said about the, the, the walking floor and surface quality, if you have in pasture a lot of stones, a lot of uneven surface, remember that if one claw is supported, the other one drops to the ground, you get this overextension of the interdigital skin as a risk factor for import of entry for microbes, not only for DD, but for foot rot as well. And, and any infections really. So having foot baths in, um, I think in beef cattle on pasture, like cow calf um, operations or dairy, um, I think it, it's a possibility. The, um, with regards to organic dairy, that where, where things are more limited in terms of possibilities of choice for chemicals and exposure to chemicals, I would say, um, the detection effort on these um, farms should be even more intensive to catch lesions earlier than the chronic proliferative lesions, because then the way of no return is much more likely. Um, have, having some form of a trained person being able to visualize the feet while cattle are walking, or cattle are in the parlor, or if it has heifers, um, having them acquainted with human presence in the sense of this low, stock, low stress stockmanship is a good thing. I just returned from Nebraska where we were on cow-calf ranches trying to trace where do these lesions start. And we looked at um, very young, just pregnant um, heifers. And um, the, the gentleman owner of the rancher told me, you know, if, if we were not training these cattle, they would be over the hill before you could ever look at them close enough to have a, 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 an idea about um, what their feet look like. So I think rather than putting in one foot bath, having this conjunction of early detection, someone trained for recognizing early lesions, someone who works with the cattle so that they are approachable and manageable 
somebody who is able to report these lesions, this would come even before I ever start thinking about a very rigorous foot bumping protocol. Once you have DD in your herd, including in the heifers, under organic farming settings, I would say choosing, um, so having the cattle acquainted with going through a shoot, for example, going through some alley, a gated alley um, area would be important. And then you put a well-designed foot bath at the end of that alley, have them no chance, give them no chance to avoid your foot bath if you intend them to go through. And in terms of um, chemicals, if you are in a preventive setting, not in the acute outbreak, I think a 1% chlorine solution will do a good job. You could choose, um, there are, there are um, plant-based um, disinfectants that are efficient at maintaining a situation that is not a DD outbreak situation. And if you have to use formalin as a form formaldehyde and, uh, or copper sulfate, keep and stick strictly to the lower concentrations and use them in an early si preventive situation would be my advice. Thank you. No, that's that's awesome. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so we had a question come in. Um, are there dietary recommendations to help in the preventative control approach of DD in cattle? So dietary, um, if you mean the the full ration, um, not so much that I'm aware of where, where there's a proven effect of um, reducing certain nutrients and increasing others. Um, there, there have been discussions about ammonia and, and um, sulfate, sulfuric acid contents. Um, this this, this is, um, has never been proven in my, my world, at least, not that I'm aware of. Something that has been proven, and I've been part of that without having any commercial interest in any of these um, products, but we have shown that there's a significant delay in outbreaks if you use certain mineral supplements. I'm going to mention the, the Zimpro um, Avelopas DD formula ones. We've shown that um, that significantly delays outbreak of outbreaks of DD in heifers. And we've shown for the Nutritec um, um, products, these are yeast-based um, products, if you use the, the Nutritec um, um, complement, feed supplements, that we can delay those outbreaks of um, DD in lactating cows significantly as well. And I think if you put these pieces together with the puzzle, then the, um, these feed supplements can play a role. Although I think including the companies are aware of the fact that they are not magic bullets that will eliminate the problem. I think putting everything together plus these feed supplements can be an option that is viable for preventing and controlling the D efficiently. Perfect, thank you. But I think that control um, D in heifers is a is a is, is like crucial. The farms that I've witnessed that have good control on DD, they will have good control of DD in their pre calving heifers. Um, in your opinion, what is best, slatted floor in heifer barns or concrete floors? I think both can work as long as you can keep the hygiene well. Um, and then this same person had a follow-up question. Um, you talk about artificial intelligence to monitor DD. Is that already a commercial product? It's not a commercial product. We are um, in the experimental phase implementing this in dairy and beef cattle farms. You have to imagine a little device that is self-contained, um, footprint of a, of a chocolate bar, a Milka chocolate bar. I see Sibylla asked this, this question or a Hershey chocolate bar, that's the footprint. There's a little lens sticking out, it has a battery and you can stick this to a feed truck or to a herdsman, to the lower leg of a herdsman. And it will actually um, record, recognize the D lesions. Um, in dairy, we have four or five different M stages that are being recognized with quite a high precision and accuracy. And in, in feed yards, we are experimentally trying this out. So it's not commercial yet, it's, it's experimental, but if you're interested, um, Cyrilla, we can talk more and can show you more about it. Anyone who is interested, I can show you how it works. We're pretty that's confident really cool. about it. And, yeah, and that's very cool. 
the reaction to artificial intelligence is often like, oh, it's going to take my job away. It's not. It's, um, it's, it's, it's meant to support your decision making processes with regards to when should I intervene? It's going to recognize DD, help recognize DD earlier and um, allow you to take decisions in a more informed way. It, it's going to create treatment lists and treatment lists with identified cows. We're gonna implement this now in a setting where we have an antenna gate and the camera is close to the antenna and the hope is that the antenna sends the idea of the cow to the camera, the camera makes the treatment list and then writes out a CSV-like spreadsheet and says this cow needs to be treated next. Very awesome handy. technology. Yeah. I just had one last question. Um, we know hygiene is so important and we know that heifers are often crammed into the older facilities and so we don't have uh, the best management practices to keep heifers clean. And so in order for treatment baths to work, we need feet to be clean. What, what is your opinion of soap baths and when they should be used and to what, to what effort do they go to, to help getting feet clean in order for a treatment bath to work? Right. Um, so if you mean soap baths as a pre-bath to a um, disinfectant bath, then you can um, talk about both. <laughs> okay. So if the soap bath or the, the washing bath is before the cow goes through your copper sulfate or formaldehyde or whichever treatment or disinfectant bath, then we discourage the pre-washing baths because they they dilute whatever the chemical is in the in the in the actual disinfecting bath. Um, I would rather put my money into improving hygiene, so having clean slatted floor, having scrapers, having um, efforts to to clean the pathways or the path where the cows walk towards the foot bath. I would rather put my money into that than a pre-washing foot bath. If we're talking about using <laughs> soap baths as alternative to the chemically um, to the chemical foot bath, then remember my customized foot bathing slide where I said there comes the moment when we have lots of these green smileys and we are on the right track. We see the flaps fall from the proliferative lesions. Then it's time to try and swap out one of those days for where, where we swap out copper sulfate, for example, for a soap bath and see whether the green trends continue. And um, the smileys are meant to allow you to have decision aids like, hey, I see the flaps continue to fall. I see my um, active lesion, the M2 lesion number go down. Um, those trends are positive. So let's try to swap out one of these chemical foot baths for a soap bath. That would be my response to that. Thank and you. particularly if you have an automated foot bath that works well, this is a, a very, rather straightforward situation. You flip a, a switch and instead of your formaldehyde, what is poured into it is a soap bath. So we just had one more question come in. Um, if producers are considering feet and leg traits in their selection program, can this help to reduce DD or the genetic predisposition for it? I think so, yes. Um, the, the breeder associations are never happy to hear this news that you need to select against another trait. But I think given the economic impact that DD has and has had upon our cattle husbandry systems, it is worthwhile considering and a pre-stage to selection, I think is separating the predisposed from the more at risk cattle and managing them in a focused way saving our resources. And another one. Oh, okay, perfect. Just Okay, um, takes us to our time. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Gopher, once again, for spending some time with us and discussing a really important topic. Um, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, um, we, we still have four sessions left. Next week, we're going to be discussing reproduction strategies with Dr. Julio Giordano with Cornell University. It'll be the same Zoom link at the same time, um, so we hope to see you all there. And once again, we just want to thank our Brain and Zen Pro. Without their support, this program would not be offered at no cost, so we're really grateful for them.